Hello and welcome back. My name is Vanessa Vasquez. I am a local tour guide here in Lima City in Peru. And well, thank you so much for your support and for watching this series of lectures and videos dedicated to the history and culture of Peru. In today's lecture, we are going to be talking about the coca leaf, its benefits, its presence in the history, along the history of Peru since pre-Hispanic times until nowadays, and also the importance of the leaf in terms of benefits we receive uh, from consuming this plant, this sacred plant. So um, for today's lecture, I have with me Marek Sakshevsky. He is not just an archaeologist and also a very uh, well um, the experienced tour guide and trip leader. He's also my husband, so we are doing several lectures uh, together. You can also see other ones I have uploaded in my YouTube channel. And uh, well, in today's lecture, we'll be talking together about this topic. But before starting, I would love to, first of all, thank to my new Patreons that are joining and helping me to support this channel. Thank you so much for that. If you would like to participate of these lectures live and also of my cooking classes uh, and my uh, different uh, uh, virtual tours I'm doing privately only and exclusively for my Patreons. Please uh, consider to support as uh, I will be leaving you below the link to my Patreon uh, site. Uh, also, I am conducting virtual tours on virtualtrips.io. These tours are tip supported. So um, we have also not just tours of Lima in that platform. There are several tours from all over the world and wonderful uh, group team of colleagues tour guides that are doing a wonderful job everywhere so um well i recommend you to go to that website remember please is www.virtualtrips.io so well let's start okay so uh, to start first of all um Marek is going to talk about uh, some important details related with the benefits of the coca leaves, its history, and I'm going to be also later talking about its uh, use in rituals in the pre-Hispanic times and until nowadays. Well, hello everybody, I'm very happy to be here with you and sharing some information and, uh, and destroying some myths about the coca leaves. Uh -huh. First of all, let me explain you what is the coca. The coca is a bush. That bush can grow to two meter high. And uh, traditionally, we use the leaf uh, uh, for cultural and nutritional purposes in our ancestral cultures here in the Andes. So that bush grow nowadays in the farms, but of course it was domesticated by uh, Andean people very, very, long time ago. Uh, the bush also have leaves, as you know, but as well as they have fruits and flowers. You see here, it's like a, you can see that there are, there are fruits and there are flowers. Nowadays, when we cultivate the, the coca leaf, so we need to uh, extract the seed from the fruits and we make the plantations in that way. But the, the, it's also a natural process of pollination. The pollinator of this plant, here's the flower, is a moth. Mm -hmm. Let me show you this moth. The scientific name of that moth is Eloria noyesi. Moths and butterflies are from the same family, but moths are just uh, flying during the nights. So this is a night insect a moth, Eloria noyesi, and the people here in the Andes know her, the common name is La Gringa, no? because she loves coca. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little about history. No? Thank you to Eloria noyesi, the flower starts to uh, spread the plant through South America, but the original uh, place of domestication of the plant is not Peru, it is not Colombia, it's Ecuador. Uh, in this part that is marked in the map in the central coast of Ecuador, 6,000 years ago, a society, 
a culture named Valdivia exists in that part of the country and in the burials of the Valdivia culture are the first traces or the face, the first coca leaves use uh, in a geological context. No? So from Ecuador, the leaf spread north to Colombia and south to Peru and Bolivia. I'm talking about 4,000 years BC or 6,000 years ago. In Peru, the first archaeological reports of coca leaves are dated 1,000 years later, 3,000 years before Christ in the place named La Galgada. It was a local temple situated in the north, some 300 kilometers north east of Lima, uh, at, when the Andes meet the desert in an altitude of around 1,000 uh, meter high in a burial in the same context. This is not a picture of that context. This is a picture of a later society, the society Wari, that uh, functioned here, created the first state in South America between the 7th and the 11th century in our era. But they put different uh, uh, items and personal belongs to the, in the burials, including coca leaf you know, for the travel to the next life. Uh, the Incas time, maybe you hear about the maidens, the young girls that were sacrificed uh, for the volcanoes and they were put on the upper parts on high mountains in the south of the Andes. Uh, so those, those girls have in their mouths traces of coca leaf. So they consume the coca leaf you know, in order to, to uh, maintain the strength and the effort to climb over 6,000 meter high. The two uh, better preserved mummies or maidens are, uh, this one is from the Vulcan Yuyayuaco in Argentina, in the border between Argentina and Chile. Is this archaeological site of the world located over 6,800 meter high? And the second one, now she's in the museum in the city of Salta, in the north of Argentina. And the second one is Juanita, the ice maiden from Arequipa in the south of Peru. She was also known as the Lady of Ampato because she was uh, found on the, on the top of the Ampato mountain at 6,300 meter high. The Inca state controlled the trade of the coca leaf. So it was a good of, a good of state, the coca leaves. The Inca uh, distribute the coca leaf uh, through all the, the state and give them the people as a reward for work. And they have multiple purposes. They have nutritional purpose, the most important, and also was used in different ceremonies. Nowadays, it's still using in that way in the Andes. Later, when the Spaniards arrived and the process of conquest began, the Spaniards saw uh, how the native people chew leaves. No? Uh, for them, it was very disgusting. Uh, they uh, wrote even that the Indians seems like a goat chewing leaves. Uh, it was the same sensation that the Indians uh, had when they saw Spaniards drinking it from, from an animal, no? because the native uh, American population, they don't drink meat from other animals because this, is, this was not natural from them, just from your mother when you were a little child. And uh, no later. But uh, taking back to our topic, so uh, the Spaniards later discovered the properties of the coca leaf. They start to chew also the coca leaf in order to resist the long travels across the mountain and the high altitude, and even the horses uh, receive coca leaves. Uh, and they also start to control the trade of the coca leaves and start to pay native. Uh, they use the coca leaf as currency. You know, they pay for the work, for example, in coca leaf. They give uh, natives coca leaf in order to work better on the mines. And the church also have big plantations of coca leaves. Uh, and even when you go to the church, and during the colonial time, you don't have any coin to leave on the plate, you can leave some coca leaves. Huh? They were similar as, as money. In that later, it was coming the report of independence in 1821, and uh, the government control on the production of the coca leaf stops. You know? And this and in the jungle uh, control their own production and 
use it for their use it for their own purposes. No, the people who live in the big cities in Lima or in the coast, they don't get involved anymore uh, in the production or control to the coca leaf until the 60s, when was an international prohibition of a uh, consume of cocaine. Mm -hmm. So uh, coca leaf is not just seen as a plant and it no, it's not just valued because of its nutritional benefits. Uh, coca leaf is still considered magical, uh, sacred, especially in the highlands uh, in the Andes, where we have still intact most of the uh, traditions related with the let's say Incan religion, but um, in intact, but also mixed with the Catholic faith in order to survive. So many of the shamans that we have in the Andes, for example, uh, still consume coca during ceremonies. And it's also very, very common that if you consult to the, cham the shamans uh, or the pacos or, well, depending on where you are, they will be called differently, but these spiritual leaders at the end, uh, at the end of, the, of the world. So um, you will be consuming also coca leaf to uh, possibly, um, let's say, ask or solicit any type of predictions in terms, for example, your future or your, um, your business or your family, um, well, basically anything that will be of your interest. In, in many cases, for example, during these ceremonies, the coca leaves uh, are used to predict the future, not just by chewing it or, or consuming it also by imprinting a little bit of you through um, let's say blowing let's say um, exhaling and imprinting uh, part of you part of your spirit in this leaves and these leaves will be a textile and according to the figures form in the textile the shaman will be able to to read this and predict uh, something for you. Uh, so um, it's very interesting to see that in many parts of the world, um, well, there are different forms of, of doing something quite similar. For example, could be with the runes, for example, or with cards, or with with different things with with bonds. Uh, this is something that uh, well, it's so so similar, so alike every everywhere around the world. Also in Asia, many societies read the future, for example, in the leaves of the tea. No? Uh, it's very interesting because different societies in the world uh, that feel that connection between nature and humans use uh, natural elements no? to reinforce or and, uh, make stronger this connection between us, no? between us and mother nature. So uh, in Peru, we still have alive many ancient traditions, as I was saying some minutes ago, but disguised with a, a sort of like a Catholic mask. Um, and, and this was a form of self-preservation you know, that uh, indigenous people from Peru, from Bolivia, from Ecuador, from all the Americas found to maintain their traditions alive and not being judged or even being killed. So for example, in this little mesa that you see here, mesa is basically table in, in Spanish, but um, also mesa in a more spiritual or, or shamanistic form, shaman, you know, is spiritual uh, leader. So in a shamanistic world will be, you know, this offering also, that's also a mesa, an offering. So you can see here uh, among different things this disposed in the table, you can see breads, you can see uh, fruits, you can see coca leaf also and cigars next to the coca leaf, you can see the image of someone past. So this is a person that, well, uh, from the family that passed away. So uh, this is a table made especially for, um, for praying for the soul of, of this person. And this is very typical during, uh, for example, the day of the dead in, in different parts of the country. If we are not going to the cemeteries, we do this at home. But this is a different mesa. This is a mesa 
uh, of a shaman and not necessarily all the shamans uh, do like very positive works. Some of them do the other ones, like what we will call black magic. Uh, sometimes it's just for defense. Sometimes it's for attacking an enemy. So um, we can see, for example, a, an interesting integration of the ancient pre-Hispanic traditions. Uh, and we can see also the cross over there. And this is the image of Sarita Colonia, which is right next to the cross. Sarita Colonia is a non-official Peruvian saint, um, also known as the saint of the prostitutes, the saint of the thieves, the saint of the um, transvestites or gays, so, um, well, all the, the outcasted, right? And we have also another interesting element here, a skull, and this is a real skull, and the skulls, which um, not necessarily belong to someone that was known by the shaman when he was alive or she was alive, sometimes they are just taken from tombs randomly, and uh, this spirit, uh, the, the spirit of the skull basically will be attached to the shaman and will do some um, works in terms of, you know, like uh, trying to, for example, solve uh, cases related with um, broken marriages or, or things like that. And, and the coca is also around this. Well, I'm just trying to give you a general idea about how coca leaf is used in a magic con uh, context too. Um, so we can see once again, the shaman coca leaf, plenty of coca leaf that he's chewing and he's not drugged by the coca leaf. This is just part of the, of the tradition. Uh, these people uh, don't receive in some cases even uh, payment with money. They receive coca leaf, which is very important for their uh, daily uh, activities too. Uh, so, and here you can see on the bottom of this, uh, well, let's say, uh, coughing. You can clearly see this is this is a, there's a dead person there. Um, coca leaf, lots of coca leaf disposed uh, at the bottom. So this shows also that still in this, let's say, context of funerals, coca leaf is important. So coca is used uh, as a way of celebrating important moments. Also coca is used to greet uh, someone that is visiting you. People will be greeting with coca, will not be shaking hands, especially in the Andes, that's very unusual. People will just offer coca to the other. Uh, and also in, in sad occasions, like for example, funeral, people will be chewing coca and offering coca to the dead. So um, as I was saying, you know, even in a more friendly, um, say more familiar context, people will, will be chewing coca and, and it's a very pleasing activity. So it's something that is really, um, really nice to be done, like slow, just chewing, forming the little bowl in your, in your mouth. Uh, also mixing that with ashes, could be ashes of, uh, for example, quinoa, which is really, really delicious. Or uh, let's say stevia. this is a stevia also, uh, that it will make very sweet also the sensation of the coca in your mouth. Oh, so once you acquire, you swallow all of the benefit of this leaf, uh, which will be after about maybe 10 minutes if you are forming this little ball in your mouth, after those 10 minutes, that you have swallowed basically all of that benefit. Um, well, you will have no more in, in the plant there, there will be no more flavor. So you will be throwing that out, not a spitting, like it will be very like nicely, delicately, respectfully taken off your mouth and put down. So that's the way how we also chew the coca. And now let's talk about the benefits of the coca leaf. And first of all, we want to give you an idea of the different compa components that uh, are part of this leaf. First of all, some of the vitamins uh, that uh, we, we have in this plant. And also I have a little list of the benefits of each one uh, of these uh, components. No? For example, potassium is really good for your nerves, muscles, and is a diuretic. Vitamin C is a natural uh, protector from the sun, 
Mm -hmm. And also it increases your uh, energy. It's really good for your skin and hair. Uh, phosphorus is also very good for your memory and concentration and it cleans your kidneys. Uh, also helping your bones and your teeth. Mm -hmm. Uh, flavonoids are really good antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, mm -hmm, and uh, they increase your immunologic system. Calcium, everybody knows that uh, it is good for bones and teeth. And um, keep in mind that in Peru, in the Andes especially, it's, it's not very common for people to be drinking lots of, of milk, animals' milk. So, uh, but instead, people use a lot of coca, chew coca. And for example, mothers-to-be chew a lot of coca leaf. And well, now we know how good it is for them because it has lots of calcium. So, um, well, this is a great or let's say um, uh, source of calcium for people that are vegans, especially, no? So this is an excellent, an excellent uh, thing for them. Uh, magnesium also is really good for controlling your heartbeat rate. Mm -hmm. uh, and also it, um, let's say, nivellates it, it, um, it, it improves, let's say, the um, control of the sugar in your blood. Mm -hmm. uh, fiber, of course, is good for your intestines. And uh, vitamin E is, an antioxidant. And well, also, let me check with you this other list. This is the list of the alkaloids that uh, exist in the plant. So not everything is about the vitamins uh, or for example, the calcium. Uh, in this part, we will get to understand why this plant is so effective in the altitude and also is so good for preventing, for example, people feeling tired, or it gives so, so much energy for people that work plugging the land, the earth in the Andes. So um, here we will get to understand also the benefits of each one of these um, alkaloids. So let's start with the ecnomine. This is an anesthetic, an analgesic. Mm -hmm. Pectin uh, regulates the amount of toxicity in your organism. So it cleans your organism from toxi toxins. Uh, Novocaine is very good uh, against, for example, diabetes. And it's an anesthetic. Papain, uh, um, let's say, improves your digestion. Mm -hmm. Hydrine uh, generates oxygen. Uh, globulin is very good for regulating your um, blood pressure. So that's why it works very good um, with the altitude sickness. Oh, it's, it's, it's a really good regulator of your blood pressure. So py pyridine or pyridine uh, is very good to control your thyroids, for example, ovarius um, and let's say testicles. Like it, it is really good especially in the sexual organs. And it also regulates hypertension. Hypertension. Also, this is also fantastic for, for using in a daily basis. And let's continue. We have quinolina. It works, um, let's say, um, as a very good anti-paludic or anti-malaria. Uh, um, uh, agent. So it's, it's fantastic also for people that, you know, exposed, are exposed to traveling to the jungle, let's say. Cocaina or cocaine no, is an stimulant. Atropine is an anesthetic. Benzoin uh, is really good uh, as a treatment for uh, gastritis and ulcers. Inulin improves the functioning of your liver. Mm -hmm. Conin is an analgesic, oh, uh, so that's another analgesic, really good. Cocamine is another analgesic. So now let's talk about the bad fame of the coca leaf, of course, related with cocaine, um, the bad part of all this history. 
Okay, let me explain you. When our countries here in South America, we get the independence in the first half of the 19th century. So the researchers from different parts of Europe came to South America to make, inv to make investigation, research on nature and culture and history. You know? And one of them, Albert Niemann, uh, was very interesting in the diet of the native people. And he saw that the uh, natives consume a lot of coca leaf. And of course, for, for him was very strange and that they can work and they resist, they don't have altitude sickness. So he took some leaves and take them to Germany and the university, the university of Gotinga in 1860, he isolated all the alkaloids that Vanessa mentioned before. The biggest part of those alkaloids were already known by the science at that time. But he found one that he never saw before. And of course, because the name of the plant is coca, he named the alkaloid cocaine. So this is the first mention of cocaine and the isolation of the alkaloids in 1860. So the isolation of the alkaloids was in liquid form. Yeah. So he assumed that all the power of the leaf or the power that the leaf gives to the native people were related with cocaine. But this is not true because uh, all the benefits of the coca leaf uh, and all the benefits of each alkaloid work better when they are acting together, hmm? not isolated. And here, you know this happy man that is here? This is a pope, a pope, Pope Leon XIII. Uh, the first use that this concentrate of cocaine had in Europe was as a tonic, as a stimulant, and was put on the wine and mixed wine with uh, extract of, coca of cocaine, and it was named the Mariani wine. And the Mariani wine was very popular in Italy in the end of the 19th century, and uh, one of the best consumers of that uh, beverage was the Pope Leon XIII. As you see, the guy was very happy. He died very old in 1903, having 93 years old. Uh, imagine that was 100 years ago. And he was a Pope for 25 years, being the third longest uh, Pope, no? with the longest uh, papacy. I don't think this is a word in English. No, the first was, was Pio IX, the second was Jean Paul II, and the third one was Leon XIII, the happy pope that drinks wine with cocaine. Mm. Another very famous user and promoter of the use of cocaine, because the use of cocaine was very common in Europe and the First World War, Sigmund, Sigmund Freud, uh, he itself used cocaine as a stimulant, as a tonic, he uh, uses as antidepressive, no? Uh, for example, uh, also for people who have different uh, vicious, for example, alcoholics or use of morphine, they, uh, he held those people using uh, cocaine. And he write a lot of articles regarding the benefits of cocaine. As I told you, that cocaine in liquid. Another history is the Coca-Cola. The Coca-Cola created in Atlanta in 1888 had cocaine itself. 10 milligrams of cocaine per each glass of Coca-Cola, no, 10 milligrams. So it was uh, also uh, promote as a um, tonic and of course for headache as uh, an exhaustion as you, as you see there. The Coca-Cola put cocaine in the, in the beverage until the first world war. No, later it was uh, canceled. They don't put the cocaine anymore because it was considered as a doping uh, while Coca-Cola started to sponsor Olympic games after the first world war. So uh, the athletes drink Coca-Cola and there were more stimulators. So the Coca-Cola finally needs to uh, cancel or forbid the use of, of cocaine in the beverage. Actually, Coca-Cola still use coca leaf. No? They buy coca leaf from Peru and Bolivia and they extract the they extract the cocaine excuse me they buy coca leaf from peru and bolivia they extract the cocaine of the leaf and they use the leaf uh, for the flavor for flavor of coca cola and the cocaine they 
get from the leaf is using for medical purposes, no? Or making anesthetics, for example. Benzocaina, novocaina, that was used by dentists, but oculists contain cocaine. Very interesting. Another singular person that consumes cocaine, <laughs> officially, Sherlock Holmes, in the books of Arthur Conan Doyle, in some cases, he used cocaine in order to be more clever. But the, the one that really consumes and, <laughs> and don't accept this was Arthur Conan Doyle, of course, the, uh, the writer, no? the creator of Sherlock Holmes. Okay, but getting back in South America, the coca leaves are used in different purposes. Uh, the, in the countries that produce, the countries that produce coca leaf nowadays are three, basically, Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador. Excuse me, Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. In Ecuador, that is the place where the coca leaf uh, was uh, used for the first time, nowadays is forbidden. Now, since the 60s, uh, the government of Ecuador forbid totally the uh, production of coca leaves in their country. And Ecuador is a small country, that is a small country that you can control. So in Ecuador, the coca leaf, the production of coca leaves is forbidden. In Colombia, it's totally illegal. It's not legal to uh, grow coca leaves. In Bolivia, in the, other, in the opposite way, it's totally legal to produce coca leaf. And in Peru, is in between a both of them. Because here in Peru, you can grow coca leaves, but you need to register your production in the Ministry of Agriculture. No? If your production is not registered or your farm is not registered in the Ministry of Agriculture, your farm is illegal. So from these legal farms and also in Bolivia from their farms, the, uh, we make a lot of products very interesting. For example, the most famous is the coca tea. No? The coca tea that helps a lot with the digestion and altitude problems is uh, produced in Bolivia and Peru. In Bolivia, they have a big company named Windsor that produce many kinds of tea, uh, the, the very good, very good teas. So it's more, more developed and they consume more that coca leaves than us because the population of Bolivia is more concentrated in the in the high altitudes. And in the case of Peru, the biggest part of our population lives on the coast. Uh, in the coast, we don't consume the coca leaf because we think uh, in the coca leaf as something very exotic that the native communities in the Andes or in the jungle use, but not in big cities uh, like Lima, for example. Hmm? And also, of course, coca candies, they are very common. The tourists always uh, suck coca candies, but uh, it's just the candy, just the flavor, uh, really concentrate of flavor of the coca, of the leaf with sugar, that's all. Mm. Not really helps too much. Other thing is the uh, flavor, the, uh, the flower, excuse me, of coca that is used in cooking. Uh, uh, for example, when you make bake uh, cakes or cookies, you can add coca, uh, coca flour. And also as a dietary supplement, especially for women that are in pregnancy, because it had a lot of uh, calcium and also iron. So it's a good supplement of, uh, of calcium and iron, and also helps with the problems related with high blood pressure during the pregnancy because of the alkaloids that regulate the blood pressure. Other interesting product is creams, creams made on coca that uh, helps in the pains, for example, of the joints, headache or muscles because of all of the anesthetic alkaloids that it contains. Uh, so you uh, can use the creams for that purpose as an analgesic anesthetics too. Well, it was a pleasure to have you today. I hope you enjoyed this uh, little lecture about such important topic, the coca leaf. Um, I'm sure we can spend hours talking about this plant, but we were just trying to give you a summarized version of the best uh, of this uh, very important Peruvian, South American product. So, well, thank
Thank you so much for uh, following, for your support once again. And um, well, if you are watching this video on YouTube, you can subscribe and activate the little bell. So in that way you can get to know every time I post something new immediately. Uh, and well, you can also keep learning about the history and the culture of Peru. Uh, also, if you feel like it, uh, please share this video. Um, as I said before, subscribe. We have an Instagram, we have a Facebook page. Uh, so we will be delighted to, to have you there and to be able to, to connect with you, to receive your questions directly. So, well, thank you so much and hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Uh,